I'm Patricia Baird Clark, and I want to welcome you to the second part of my teaching on the Golden Altar of Incense. Um, we learned in part one that we are to build a strong prayer and word life, which is the Golden Altar of Incense. We're to worship God in all things and pray about absolutely everything, and as we do so, there will be no limits to the closeness we can have with God in these end times. And as we continue to seek the Lord in prayer and worship Him, we will begin to see things the way Jesus does, and the presence of God will go with us wherever we go, and we will carry the Word of God to other people. The, our life is going to be shared with the Lord, and uh, together we will go forth and teach others, and the Lord will be doing some marvelous things as we go forth together, which we will see here in part two. Now Exodus 30, verse 5, continuing on with the golden altar. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. Staves, as I explained in part 1, represent portions of the word of God. Shittim wood is a strong word. We are to know these portions of the word of God very well. We are to be prepared. We are to study, and we are to make preparations that uh, God will guide us in. God's going to be revealing some marvelous things in His Word, and we are to prepare teachings that we're going to take forth to other people. And overlay here means expansion of outlook. And uh, of course, we're overlaying them with gold, with gold representing Jesus. And so, this expansion in outlook, God is going to begin to expand. Uh, he's going to be doing some things with the Word of God that we have prepared, things that we couldn't possibly have done. Uh, expand in Merriam-Webster Dictionary means to increase the extent, the number, the volume, or the scope of. And so it's not going to be just teaching, but the Spirit of God that goes with us, His presence goes, His presence goes with us wherever we are. He's going to be uh, performing this Word. He's going to be doing some wonderful things. I'll give you an example of that on the next slide. But first I want to state this verse again and give you my written interpretation. Verse 5 states, And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. My written interpretation is, You are to prepare portions of the Word of God. These are teachings that you prepare, that's staves. These teachings are to be strong, that's shittim wood. Jesus, gold, will increase the extent and scope, that's outlook, or, of these teachings. Once more, you are to prepare portions of the Word of God. These are teachings that you prepare. These teachings are to be strong. Jesus will increase the extent and scope of these teachings. So I said I would share an example of this. Um, it was when I was preparing this word here, and I was I was preparing this slide for this teaching, and I was thinking that this meant God was going to be doing some things uh, as I taught, but I really didn't know what it was. So the same day I'm working on this slide, I get a letter uh, via my website from someone in Australia who had been listening to one of my videos on my site. It was. Uh, the series on Judah from Dissociation to Perfection is revealed in Judah. And he just started listening to that series when all of a sudden he felt and saw a demon come out of him and land in a tree nearby and just look at him like he couldn't speak a word. This demon couldn't say anything. He looked very sad because he'd just been made to leave the man by the Lord. And this person felt a bunch of uh, anguish and agony leave his soul something that had been with him for a very long time and he just wasn't able to find any help and uh, just he just started listening to this teaching on this video and he got delivered of a demon and so uh, this is what I'm talking about this is what the ministry in the end times is going to be like when we're willing to yield our lives totally to Jesus and that he can come into us press his life into ours, let his humility spread throughout our life, 
And then wherever we go, his presence goes with us. And when we share the word of God with others, Jesus is going to be performing it. So I wasn't even there. It was just on the internet teaching that God did that for this man. I thought that was so marvelous that that happened on the, and I get this letter from him on the same day I was preparing this teaching. Continuing now with verse 6 of Exodus 30. And thou shalt put it, that's the golden altar of incense, thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. So the golden altar of incense was right up next to the veil that was covering the Holy of Holies with the, with the Ark of the Covenant on the other side that represented um, where God's presence was. And uh, so that was the closest possible place anybody could be to the Lord, was right there, right up next to the veil. And uh, the golden altar as we've learned, is the life of a Christian uh, in the fullness of Christ, one with Christ. Um, this was a continuation of part one, where this person's life and the life of Jesus have become so one that the Lord can live his life through that person and minister through that person. And then uh, this person is in the closest possible place to God, this side of the veil. And that's what worship and prayer will do for us. It draws us close to the Lord. It brings us into his presence. Now, if you'll remember, the mercy seat was covered by cherubim. I taught on this extensively in the beginning of the tabernacle series. The cherubim is defined in the Hebrew as an imaginary figure. And the cherubim represent the holy imagination. And as they're facing each other over the mercy seat, uh, it's our holy imagination reaching uh, across to the holy imagination of Jesus. And uh, that's where we have fellowship. And uh, the holy imagination is our link from the natural into the supernatural, from just knowing about the Lord in our mind to actually experiencing him uh, in a greater fullness. And so this is a very important concept here. But we want to just keep in mind that this is the closest possible place to the Lord here, just outside the veil. Now I'll give my written interpretation for this verse, and thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with thee. My interpretation is you are to live your life as close to me as you possibly can, that's before the veil, and I will have close fellowship with you as you meet with me in your holy imagination. That's the mercy seat. So the close relationship that we have with the Lord is the source of the powerful anointing that goes forth on the teachings uh, that we talked about in the previous verse. So we don't have to do anything special to make these things happen as we minister. It's because we have a very close relationship with God. That's where the anointing comes from. So all we have to do is just enjoy Jesus. It's it's phenomenal. We just praise Him, worship Him, and pray about everything, and study the Word, and then God is just going to be doing all kinds of things uh, that we couldn't possibly do, and we don't have to work at it. This is really coming into the rest of the Lord. We don't have to make things happen. Uh, God just moves by His Spirit, and lives will be changed. Continuing on now with verse 7, which states, And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. The uh, In my type here, Aaron is a type of Christ, our high priest. Burn in the Hebrew means fumigation, or driving out the inhabitants. Sweet incense is our prayers. We established that in part one. Morning has to do with rising early as Jesus did. There's nothing like that early morning time, if your schedule permits it, when no one else is up. You know the phone isn't going to ring. No one's going to come knocking on your door. And this is time that you have set aside just to be with the Lord. 
and he ministers to us there as he dresses our lamp the lamp is uh, the candlestick that was there in the holy place and it's a type of our spirit dresseth means to make well or to minister and here is the key verse for uh, my interpretation of the lamp as being the spirit our spirit Proverbs 20 verse 27 the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly and I believe the belly represents the soul so as we're praying and worshiping the Lord is working in our soul to purify it and drive out anything impure that would be fumigation to drive out the inhabitants anything there that doesn't belong there as we're worshiping and praying the Lord is ministering to us we may not realize it we may not know what he's doing but he's working in us and then the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord God illuminates our spirit he shows us things that we need to know and so this is a very precious time this early morning time with the Lord where he ministers to us and we're talking things over with him and worshiping him it's a very special time and now my written interpretation for verse 7 and Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps he shall burn incense upon it I have incense upon it in italics here because that's actually not in the Hebrew my interpretation is as we pray and worship that sweet incense Jesus Aaron will burn up any impurities in us that's burn as he ministers to our soul that dresses the lamps as we pray and worship Jesus will burn up any impurities in us as he ministers to our soul so how important this early morning time is this special time set aside to be with the Lord just think of all we're missing if we don't take the time to do this and how can we ever come into the fullness of Christ and uh, and be one with him if we don't have this special time with him this is so important Continuing on with verse 8, And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Aaron, as I said before, is a type of Jesus. Lighteth in the Hebrew is Allah. A primary meaning is to ascend, to cause to ascend up, or to arise. The lamps, I said before, represents our spirit from Proverbs 20:27, 20, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord and in Hebrew that word candle also means lamp even in my interpretation is night when we are sleeping and now my written interpretation for part a and when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even when is not in Hebrew Jesus will lift up that slideth our spirit lamps at night when we are sleeping that's even Jesus will lift up our spirit at night when we are sleeping I've had experiences upon awakening in the morning when I knew I had been with Jesus during the night and there was just a a knowing there was a residual feeling if you will that I knew I'd been with him and also very often I will study a passage and I won't be able to crack it I just cannot understand what it means spiritually and uh, but I'll wake up the next morning and I've got it and I know the Lord gave it to me during the night when I was sleeping so I, I think it's a wonderful thing that we don't remember it because it's behind the veil activity but when we're sleeping at night Jesus is working in our spirit and I think uh, there's even some relationship going on there at night when we're sleeping and continuing on with part B he shall burn incense upon it a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations burn we saw earlier it's guitar in the Hebrew it means fumigate and drive out the inhabitants incense is the same word as burn it isn't always the same word but here it is it is a golden altar our life perpetual means always incense this is sweet incense and I believe this is the fragrance of relationship when we pray and worship we're having relationship with the Lord and this is a sweet fragrance of a relationship before is panim 
In Hebrew, it's the same word that means the face. And here's my written interpretation for part B. He shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. As we are sleeping, that was part A, the Lord will purify, that's burn incense, our soul, which is our life, it, with the sweetness of relationship, that's sweet fragrance of incense, that comes from being before the face, before the Lord. This will always be for as long as we live on this earth, throughout your generations. Once more, as we are sleeping, the Lord will purify our soul, which is our life, and the sweetness of relationship that comes from being before His face. This will always be for as long as we live on this earth. Now to put together parts A and B. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Jesus will lift up that lighteth our spirit lamps at night when we are sleeping even. And as we are sleeping, the Lord will purify, that's burn incense, our soul, which is our life, it, with the sweetness of relationship, sweet incense, that comes from being before his face, before the Lord. This will always be for as long as we live on this earth, throughout your generations. Once more, Jesus will lift up our spirit at night when we are sleeping, and as we are sleeping, the Lord will purify our soul, which is our life, with the sweetness of relationship that comes from being before his face. This will always be for as long as we live on this earth. I don't believe that this goes on with everybody who professes to be a Christian, but certainly for those that are pursuing the Lord and doing all they can to come into his presence and obey him, I believe this is going on in our lives every night. And uh, the Lord just doesn't waste time. He works in us when we're awake and he works in us when we're asleep and as I mentioned before earlier I have had experiences upon awakening that caused me to know I had been in the presence of the Lord and I, I remember once where I just knew I had been with him face to face but I didn't have any memory of it but I knew it had, it had been so and so this is a wonderful thing it's going on beyond, behind the veil but there's going to come a day when we are fully perfected, when we will have these experiences and remember them, because the veil will be open to us. And continuing on with verse 9 of Exodus 30, Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. The definition I'm going to be using for strange incense comes from Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, where we read the account of Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, who also served as priests, where they were burning incense, but not according to the direction of the Lord. Uh, and it was called strange fire. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense therein, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. So here Aaron had just seen his two sons die when God sends fire out of heaven and burns them up, but he has nothing to say because he realizes that they had not respected the holiness of God. And we have to remember that as, no matter how close we draw to the Lord here with the golden altar of incense, that He is always the Holy One. He is always higher than we are. And we want to be sure that we always live in strict obedience to what the Lord has indicated He wants from us. And so in the as we have this very close relationship with Him, also, there's this respect for God's holiness. Now, there are three offerings here that were all activities of the brazen altar. The uh, burnt sacrifice, the meat offering, and the drink offering were all things that were done in the court 
the outer court on the brazen altar and this all has to do with different aspects of the lord's work of atonement and i believe what this is saying here is that we are not to continually uh, fellowship with the lord in talking about his historical work on the cross and the forgiveness of our sins this is all true and it's all wonderful but here we want to progress further in relationship uh, with where it's, it's more bride and bridegroom kind of relating uh, makes me think of Hebrews 6 1 therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ let us go on unto perfection and so that's the kind of uh, activity going on here at the golden altar of incense just the deep loving relationship and admiration of the Lord and worship of him that is just far deeper than any relationship we've ever known with him and now I will give my written interpretation for Exodus 39 ye shall offer no strange incense thereon nor burnt sacrifice nor meat offering neither shall you pour drink offering thereon my interpretation is you are to always respect the holiness of God and walk in total obedience to him keeping him uppermost in your heart your relationship will not be focused on the basic doctrines of faith but rather on your deep loving relationship that will bring you into perfection and finally we come to verse 10 which is the last verse regarding the golden altar in Exodus 30 and Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations it is most holy unto the Lord Aaron as always in this segment represents the Lord now we have to, have to remember this is not about brazen altar activity or the forgiveness of individual sins we saw that in verse 9 which said you shall offer no uh, strange incense thereon nor burnt sacrifice nor meat offering neither shall you pour a drink offering thereon that was all to be done at the brazen altar uh, this is a place of relationship and worship and prayer and so this is not about individual sins uh, that's regarding the brazen altar our key for unlocking this passage for the spiritual meaning is the phrase once in a year the individual sins were taken care of at the brazen altar but once a year at the Feast of Tabernacles on the Day of Atonement the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies beyond the veil and he would offer up a, a sacrifice in the blood that he sprinkled on the altar and uh, various places behind the veil that was to forgive all the sins of Israel and so what we're talking about here at the very end times is yes we know that God has forgiven all of our sins but he's going to take us into a place where humankind has never been before he's going to remove the sin nature we've seen this uh, earlier in the tabernacle series he's going to take us to a place where we will sin no more because sin will no longer be part of our being and that will enable us then to go on the other side of the veil into the presence of God it's very significant that this happened at the Feast of Tabernacles the Feast of Tabernacles as far as the church goes has not been fully identified in its meaning we know that Israel had three feasts we know that the Feast of Passover was a type of our salvation we know that the Feast of Pentecost was a type of the coming of the Holy Spirit or the baptism in the Holy Spirit but the Feast of Tabernacles has not been fully identified I believe it is yet to take place it's for the end times for one thing it took place at the harvest time in the fall of the year when they gathered in the harvest and uh, these end times this is the time of the harvest when God is going to be uh, gathering in his uh, faithful ones and there's going to be a great spread of the gospel throughout the world and uh, a great removing of the tares and the great judgment of God so it was on this day the tenth day the seventh month at the Feast of Tabernacles 
that the high priest went behind the veil with the golden altar of incense. So um, I assume that he carried the altar behind the veil. If he didn't carry it, the veil was at least completely pulled back so that the golden altar was right there by the Ark of the Covenant, which represented where God dwelled. And so there we see the golden altar and the ark together in the Holy of Holies. And I believe this is saying that Jesus will carry us beyond the veil into the presence of God. And we see here in Hebrews 9, where I, I brought up before, that uh, it describes the uh, placing of the furniture and the golden altar of incense is on the other side of the veil. Uh, let's look at this again. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and that's what I've been calling the holy place. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, that's the holy of holies, which had the golden censer, which is the golden altar of incense, we looked at that word in the Greek, and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. So there it is, the golden altar of incense rep representing us, our life of prayer and worship, is now in the Holy of Holies, in the presence of God. If you happen to be looking at this verse in your Bible, you'll see that the word atonement is here in verse 10 three times. And three is the number of completion and perfection. So that also speaks to me of coming into uh, perfection in the end times. Horns throughout this study have been a type of power and the blood was sprinkled specifically on the horns and they are mentioned in this verse. Now power is going to be fully sanctified and will not be misused. So we will be able to go forth and minister in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and because he will have dealt with sin because we are one and he is ministering through us his power will not be misused. And this verse says near the end, and he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. Well, God's sacrifice for us was to save people of all generations. Those who came before the cross could look forward by faith towards the cross. And those who have come after the cross look back and, and with the greater understanding knowing that it was Jesus who died for our sins. But there has been a way to God available in all generations. But I believe here in the end, throughout your generations, it's a specific generation. Those of us alive on the earth now will be the first generation to have had the opportunity to enter into the fullness of Christ. This could only be in the end times, at the final judging of all things. And so what a glorious thing it is to be alive at this time and to be in Christ and to have the opportunity to enter into full, sta uh, full stature and full salvation and completion, perfection, something that has never been attained before this time. I'm going to state this verse one more time and then give you my written interpretation. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. And here is my written interpretation for Exodus 30, verse 10. Jesus' work of atonement will be fully experienced by those in the end times who have persevered in prayer, worship, and obedience, such that Jesus could remove all their sin nature and carry them behind the veil into the presence of God. They will then minister God's power to a world embroiled in the great end-time judgment of all things. This is all consecrated to God to bless Him and accomplish His purpose for all humanity. Let me read that once more. Jesus' work of atonement will be fully experienced by those in the end times who have persevered in prayer, worship, and obedience such that Jesus could remove all their sin nature and carry them behind the veil into the presence of God. They will then minister God's power to a world embroiled in the great end-time judgment of all things. This is all consecrated to God to bless Him and accomplish His purpose for all humanity. 
I fully believe, based on all my studies and the witness of the Holy Spirit, that we're going to see Jesus the head being joined with the body. And people are going to look at those who've come into the fullness of Christ, and they're going to see Christ in us. And this is how they're going to see him at this time. They're going to see him in his body. And here are some scriptures that are some favorites of mine that I believe uh, show this to be true. Romans 8:18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now some translations have changed that to say to us, but it really is in us. In Colossians 3, 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. 2 Thessalonians 1, 10a when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. So clearly there will be much more going on here than people looking up in the sky and seeing Jesus in the clouds. They're going to be seeing him in his people, in his body. And I believe that the scriptures about seeing him in the clouds are actually showing us a type or a symbol of what is actually coming and that has served God's purpose down through the ages because there are things that were not to be known until the very last of the last days when the Holy Spirit could reveal it through many places in his word here are two more scriptures from Romans 8 for whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And here are the last two scriptures I want to share regarding this. First John 3, 2 Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And as I have taught in several places, we see spiritually according to what is in our heart. And we cannot see Jesus because we have darkness in our heart. But when the darkness is removed from our hearts, uh, then we can see him as he is. And so when he appears, we'll be able to see him. But those that are still in darkness will see him in the body. And John 14:12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And so, we have not seen these greater works yet. Some have thought the greater work was the spreading of the gospel all over the world, and of course that is a great work. But I believe Jesus had more in mind when he said this. We really are going to see phenomenal miracles take place and Jesus is going to be able to be more than one place at a time because he will be in his many membered body who can be many places on the earth at the same time and we're going to have the power power such as the world has never seen before and what Jesus show, demonstrated to us when he was on earth in the miracles that he worked we will work those also but even greater miracles than those not because there's anything in, in, and, in and of ourselves that could do this but it's because Christ will be in us and it will be time for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven and we will have a part of bringing that kingdom to the earth this brings to a conclusion my 18 part series on the tabernacle it turns out to be over 12 hours of teaching when I began doing the series I had no idea it would last that long but there is a lot here for the church of the end times and it takes time to dig it out and explain it but I hope you've been blessed by this and I want to encourage you to begin to study the scripture this way on your own I only have done a few chapters or books of the Bible but I believe that the secrets of the end times are buried beneath the surface of most of the Bible and it is really most enjoyable to dig in there and to find these things 
And I know God rejoices when we study the Bible, and He likes to show us things. So I encourage you to get in there and dig for yourself and see what the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal to you about the end times. It's much more fun to find it on your own than to hear what someone else has discussed.